Just a heads up, today's episode contains a graphic description of violence. We're on our way to the church. This week, we start things off with a trip to church with some Sunday school kids and our guide. It's recording. Co Bragg, freelance reporter for The Atlantic. So don't push no buttons. We're heading to Mount Zion to worship the Lord. (laughs) Mount Zion United Methodist Church is a fixture in the African-American community in Philadelphia. Not the Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, the small, small town of Philadelphia, Mississippi. There's a little marker off Highway 16. Once you get down Road 747, Mount Zion is kind of sits to me up on a hill. My mom married my stepdad at this church, and that's the church my stepdad grew up going to. And so I've always been thinking about this church. This church is famous in American history. After you get out of the gravel driveway, there's a little walkway. It's not a grand entrance. It's a very quaint, simple, southern brick church. And there's these wooden pews. Um, throughout, there's these stained glass windows. So in Mount Zion Fellowship Hall, there are these framed newspaper clippings that archive the civil rights crime that happened here in 1964. In June of 1964, At the height of the civil rights movement, during what became known as Freedom Summer, the Ku Klux Klan burned Mount Zion to the ground. The FBI announced the finding of three bodies in graves at the site of a dam near Philadelphia, Mississippi. And murdered three civil rights workers in cold blood. The finding of the bodies of the three Mississippi civil rights workers is a saddening and shocking reminder the brutality of race hatred. It was one of the most notorious crimes of the civil rights era and helped lead to the passage of the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is signed at the White House by President Johnson. President Johnson calls for all Americans to back what he calls a turning point in history. Years later, it was made into a Hollywood blockbuster, Mississippi Burning starring Gene Hackman and Francis McDormand. Rest of America don't mean a damn thing. You in Mississippi now. But today, if you pass through the town of Philadelphia, Mississippi, you wouldn't even know this crime happened. To this day, it's easier to spot a Confederate monument in Philadelphia than to see any mention of the crime or the town's role in Freedom Summer. So, Co went down to the local history museum to see how they dealt with it. And there was, like, an older white woman there, and she asked me if I wanted a tour, and I was like, yeah, I want a tour. There's these diagrams of what the town would have looked like. Then you go into another room, and there's, like, a diorama of, like, a living room with, like, what white women would have been wearing to dinner at the time. And that's pretty much it. So we get back downstairs, and I'm like, Did I miss something? Or where's the stuff about Mount Zion? And it was just quiet. Eventually, the guide was kind of like, well, this is about the before times, like before civil rights, before all the conflict. And I was like, okay, it's clear that they don't want to engage with that history. And that's what's wild about when you come here, there's nothing. And when you ask people about it, you feel gaslit. Like, am I am I tripping? Like, do y'all really not have anything about Freedom Summer, 1964, in a historical museum? But there is an unofficial network of Black tour guides who lived this history. 
but they're kind of off the grid and you have to know who to ask to get connected to them. Truth is uncomfortable. Sun, the sun burns when you have to stand in it, but it cleanses. The town of Philadelphia, Mississippi, is famous for a crime that you might have learned about in school. A crime that the state of Mississippi was complicit in. A horrific crime that brought Martin Luther King Jr. to town that shocked the nation. But it's a crime that in 2022, some people who live there still refuse to talk about. This week, reporter Ko Bragg talks to one of the few people who insist on talking about it in a town that would rather forget. I'm Julia Longoria. This is The Experiment, a show about our unfinished country. Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful day for this time of the year in Mississippi. So if you were coming to Philadelphia and you wanted to learn about the history here, one of the people you'd likely get connected to is Obi Riley. I live in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, this is where I were born and grew up. I'm going to go back and ask you this. Who are you to me? I'm, I am your dad. If I'm in the grocery store or something and someone's like, who are you kin to or whatever? My answer is usually like, you probably know Obi Riley. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, that's my stepdad. He's certainly the fixture and most people know him. He's also a Coast Guard veteran who was elected as a county supervisor, which means he gets calls for everything from people whose cats go missing to like a sewer break to like a road that needs fixing. And uh, so I am a, a person that is uh, really and truly blessed to be able to just take advantage of the many opportunities to try and make this place that we live a little better place. Opie believes that if Philadelphia is ever going to truly be a better place, then it has to reckon with its past. And one of the ways to face the past head on is through these tours that Opie and a cohort of unofficial tour guides who are connected to Mount Zion show tourists and students what happened during Freedom Summer 1964 in the place that it happened from the perspective of people who lived it. It's important to uh, mark those hollow grounds and, and just share it with as many people as you can since there's not a, a big movement to preserve it. Where does he take you on the tour? Yeah, so, I mean, we start in our driveway. Which truck? Uh, we, we're going to take the Dodge. Which is on the way to Mount Zion. This is the area that I grew up now. We, we take Road 747, which goes right through Longdale, which is historically a Black landowning community, and to this day is still very much filled with Black families who live on either lots of acres or in mobile homes, but who all know each other. Uh, this area right here was uh, was the, was a school. The, the black school was located in this this area here, the old Long Hill School, 19, built in 1949. That's my mom's uh, house. And then we pull into the church's gravel driveway. And this is the church in the uh, fellowship hall. The church was a wood church. It was a wood plank church. Growing up there, I can remember, uh, you know, the the noises that the preacher made uh, when he was uh, getting into his uh, rhythm and, you know, and sometimes they snort and stomp and me and my friends, we could barely contain ourselves. All those things was just so funny to us. In 1964, when Obi was only two years old, Mount Zion became designated as a freedom school, a place to organize the Black community around one of the biggest causes of the civil rights movement. They called it Freedom Summer, 1964, a drive to register blacks long denied the right to vote. Southern states were using poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the black vote. Less than 10% of eligible black voters in Mississippi were registered. So black churches like Mount Zion were at the center of an effort to register more and more black people. The big thing was, uh, it's just the uh, pure fact of trying to register citizens that was qualified to, to 
participate in the uh, American dream, you know. So on June 16th, a bunch of Mount Zion church members were gathered there to handle some church business. Miss Georgia Rush and her son was uh, was there that day. Mr. Bud Cole and Miss Beatrice Cole, we called her Cousin Beatty, was there. So the KKK knew that Mount Zion had been designated as part of Freedom Summer. And so they knew that there was this meeting happening at the church, and they had thought that there were these organizers there, but really it was just your regular Mount Zion church folks. By the time the meeting was over, the Klan had had gathered, and they had people at the north and the south end of the driveway of the church. These men were hooded and and their faces were um, totally invisible. But they commenced to beat Miss Georgia Rush's son and her. And they brutally beat them really pretty bad. And they started to beat Mr. Bud Cole. And they beat him so fiercely and so hard that Beatrice said she thought that they were going to kill him. And she done all she could. She screamed and asked and begged and pleaded. And she recited a a uh, message, the passage is uh, something to the fact of, oh Lord, if you deny me and I throw my hands up to thee, no other help do I know. And she just screamed it at the top of her lungs and they says, oh, just, that's enough. And they, and they spared him his life. My grandfather said that about that time, he lived about halfway between my mom's house and the church. Obi's grandfather was a minister at the church, but he wasn't at Mount Zion the night that the Klan beat churchgoers, except on his walk home, he did see what happened next. He noticed a line of traffic on this little dirt road that hardly had any traffic. And he looked to the north, northwest, and he seen this big glow. And they had torched the church, and he seen the the big fire, and they got there, and, and they burned the church. When he looked up ahead, he saw that Klansmen had burned the church totally to the ground. This news hit the wire that another church had been burned in Mississippi. So within a few days, three civil rights workers who were in Ohio at the time for a Freedom Summer training heard about what happened in Philadelphia. And so they decided to come down to show solidarity with the community, but also to investigate this church burning, in part because they knew that their organizing had made the church a target. The three civil rights workers were all in their 20s, James Cheney, who's from Mississippi, actually from nearby Meridian, was Black. And Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner were white, Jewish, and they were both from New York. And these three were absolutely being surveilled at the time. The Klan had a nickname for Michael Schwerner. They called him Goatee. And they came to the site of the church and um, surveyed the, the, the damage. They stopped in the neighborhood to interview Uh, the people that was beaten fiercely. As they were leaving town, driving directly through the middle of Philadelphia, they were arrested by a Neshoba County Sheriff's officer, allegedly for speeding. They were locked up in jail, and uh, then they were released uh, uh, after dark. So we get back in the car and drive by the old jail. This is the route that that they take it. And then take the road that they would have taken when they were released from that jail. And uh, so they had to travel on down this little road here and taken a right. After the sheriffs let them out of the local jail, a caravan of Klan members followed them on the road out of town. Along here, a pickup truck pulled up beside them and tried to force them off the road. So they started a chase. And my stepdad's like, floors the gas pedal? And he's like, this is where the chase began. They were, you know, trying to make it to a, to a safe place. And uh, as they came along here, uh, a car came out from behind and put the lights on them. The sheriff's deputy. They get pulled over again. So they decided to yield to the, to the, to the lights of the deputy. And they was they was pulled over. They said somewhere in this area past Rock Cut Road. And 
they were detained here again, put into a sheriff's car and escorted back. He turned them back around towards Philadelphia. But instead of him taking them to Philadelphia, they made a they made an exit here. Klansmen had been planning these murders while James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner were locked up in the county jail. This is the uh, this is the, the murder site. They stopped the car somewhere along here. The road is surrounded by tall pine trees, and if you were to turn your car lights off, it would be pitch black. My stepdad prefaces the tour by saying, this is my recollection and this is my account of what happened based on my conversations with family and having grown up here. They stopped the car here and they said right about where that old pine tree is now, right about that stop sign, there was a tree there. So they stopped the police car here in this intersection. They pulled out James Cheney first and he is the only one of the trio who is Black and from Mississippi. And made Mickey and Andrew sit in the car and watch. And they took him and they pulled him up to that tree on right there, right here. This is as, as close of a count that I can give anybody. And they tied him to the tree and they, they started to beat him. They beat him with called log chains, chains that we used to strap logs down where they came to market, and uh, beat and torture. And when they got tired of beating him, they came back to the car and they got Mickey. And they pulled him out of the car and they shot Mickey point blank and he slid down the car dead. And when this happened, so Andrew jumped out of the car and started to run this way. And he was shot in the back. So this was after a two or three hour ordeal of beating. And so then they started to clean up the, the, the scene and get the bodies together. They gathered them up and uh, transported them over to the pond dam, disposed the car in the swamp and torched it. And that's where the, the, the all-out search began. A national search for justice after the break. I'm Julia Longoria. This is The Experiment. And we're back with reporter Ko Bragg and an attempt at a reckoning in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Mississippi has struggled to grapple with the crime that happened there from the day it was committed. And one reason why it's been difficult is because state and local law enforcement in Mississippi helped organize the murder of those three civil rights workers. While there are different accounts of what happened at the murder, Here's what we do know. The state had a taxpayer-funded commission that tracked the civil rights workers. That commission handed over their information to the local sheriff's department, and the deputy sheriff himself was one of the key perpetrators and a member of the Klan. The crime got kicked up to the FBI, who sent a team to Philadelphia to investigate. I, I can remember that from where our house was located, uh, these uh, helicopters started to fly in the air, which made a lot of noise. I guess that was kind of kind of scary because uh, I can remember kind of hiding from the aircraft underneath the house with my dog and and looking, at, and I seen men uh, in green uniforms. They looked like the little army men that I used to play with, and they was walking through our back field. And I, I remember the conversation that uh, somebody asked, what are they doing? And my dad replied, oh, they're looking for those boys. It took 44 days to find their bodies. And in the meantime, this case was in national news. It was headlines around the country. It was on television. 
Reporters from all over the country came to Philadelphia, Mississippi. The FBI today arrested 21 white men in connection with last summer's murder of three civil rights workers in Mississippi. Those arrested today must be considered innocent unless proved guilty. It is easy, of course, to be moralistic. It is easy to say that American justice and the nation's honor are at stake. Unfortunately, they are. One notable thing is that Michael Schwerner's wife, Rita, had said at the time that the only reason this case got so much attention was because her husband and Andrew Goodman were white. Dr. King, as, as a practical matter, do you think that there can be justice in Mississippi? Despite these arrests, do you think that a Mississippi jury will convict these people? Well, honesty impels me to admit that this would be very difficult. So the state of Mississippi is actually the only entity that had the power to charge the KKK members with murder, and the state refused to charge them. In the whole state of Mississippi, the rape and murder of Black, it was just like non-existence. So when it was the federal government that brought forth these charges, they could only charge these Klansmen with civil rights violations. And it took three years of this court battle to reach a verdict. So it was 1967 when there was finally seven convictions, eight not guilty verdicts, and three mistrials, and still not a single murder charge. And who were the men on trial? So some of the Klan members were very public people and in some instances leaders in the community. One example is Edgar Ray Killen, who was a Klan leader and a Baptist preacher. And he worked closely with the sheriff's department to organize the murders. And his trial, he ended up getting off on a mistrial because a juror said that they refused to convict the Baptist preacher. They were treated as upstanding citizens. Those people from the time of those murders until the time that they were convicted or died never lost their place in their in their community. As a matter of some of them might even might even been elevated in their community. There's this saying that justice delayed is justice denied. And I think Mississippi was reckoning with that in a lot of different spheres, stemming from the fact that in one instance, like Brown v. Board was decided in 1954. And it wasn't until around 1970, 1971 that it bothered to integrate its schools. So the failure to receive any justice for this crime, for these murders during Freedom Summer, didn't happen in a vacuum. It's happening in all of these other ways that Mississippi is holding on to its reputation for racial terrorism. It's a, you don't understand that this could affect my life and I don't want my life affected by the truth. So decades passed, and it remained an open secret that the people responsible for the Freedom Summer murders still were living, breathing members of the community. All right. The sentencing of Edgar Ray Killing is set this morning for 10 o'clock. So it was actually 40 years after the murders that the community formed a coalition and pressured the state of Mississippi to bring charges. Now, you have to remember that I have a job to do and I have to pass upon a sentence to a person who's 80 years old. And the jury did not find Mr. Killing guilty of murder, but found him guilty of manslaughter. And Edgar Ray Killen, who was that Baptist preacher who got off on a mistrial, was finally convicted for manslaughter at the age of 80 years old. And I think it's worth saying that Edgar Ray Killen went to prison on a manslaughter conviction and not for murder. What that means is that no one has ever gone to prison explicitly for murdering James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, or Michael Schwerner. All in all, it's not so dissimilar from the way that Philadelphia treats this history present day. You, you know, it's always, un- truth, truth is uncomfortable. The sun, the sun burns when you have to stand in it, but it cleanses. What I've found um, in this community is that sometimes we'll go into, rather than facing it and saying, hey, 
this is these are facts. We we kind of take the the head in the sand, the denial and uh, um, just denial, de- denying um, that anything could could have happened to him in in this town or city or county. When you pull back and think about the fact that the state of Mississippi was complicit in this crime from the very beginning, it's really not that surprising that we've never had a real reckoning. Just act like it never happened. And we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to discuss it. And it'll go away. Even over the years, there's examples of when Philadelphia has resurfaced in national consciousness and white people, particularly white people in power, have managed to leave the murders out of the history completely. In 1980, which was less than two decades after the Freedom Summer murders, Ronald Reagan chose to launch his presidential campaign in, of all places, at the county fair right outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi. And in his speech to this lily white crowd, he not only failed to mention the recent history of the Freedom Summer murders, But he focused his speech on states' rights, which was absolutely documented as a dog whistle. On top of that, recent laws that are restricting the way history is taught aren't helping. Because it's it's uncomfortable and it and it's uh, it's it's embarrassing and it's it's some uh, sores that hasn't healed. It's just been festering there, and that's why we're still here struggling over trying to tell the story. Because you're always telling, you're lancing the wound, but you're never getting to the root. And, and and that's why it keeps festering. And that's why, you know, it's so important that, you know, the story is told from all sides. And, and uh, we can only be better for it. People like my stepdad and even people a generation older than him, is it their responsibility as people who have lived and whose lives have been completely shaped by this violence, this history? Does the onus fall solely on them to make sure that we don't forget this history? Do you ever have hope that maybe the city or the county would step up and preserve this history? No, I haven't had that hope. What I've had is just a lot of struggle and effort to try and maintain the story and, and keep it alive. This story has to be told. This this has to be kept alive. If you don't, we'll fall back into the same same thing. We're like a, a recovering alcoholic, not a recovered, but a recovering alcoholic that has never faced this truth or tried to make amends to the people that they mistreated and hurt. Is it hard for you to recount this history over and over again? This history has just been part of my life. And I, I think the reason why I, I haven't been so uncomfortable with it, it didn't just happen to me, it happened to us. It, it not only happened to me and my brothers and sisters and cousins that live here, it happened to this nation. So it's not it's it's not a burden that I just carry. I just happened to be born and live here, but it, it happened to us. I, I feel that... Um, I've done a um, done a justice by sharing it, and 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 it's just like planting seeds. This is the way I, I look at Yuko. You'll do a good job doing it. You have the connections because you live it, and you're connected to the people that grew up with it. So, what better person to tell the story? This is history, and I think you're the right person to do it. That's interesting. I I think I also like have been uh, that's been like a question for me too of like um, both the balance of feeling like this is home for me and then like who whose responsibility really is this in terms of like the storytelling and I guess it's also like a generational question like who then takes up I don't know is this my responsibility you know it is yeah it's your responsibility because it is come you look at it like this. It's your responsibility to tell the story. It's my responsibility to give you the story. It wasn't meant for you to live it. It was meant for you to tell it. So that's that's what I think. Not your responsibility to fix anything. or It's your responsibility to share it, to get it out to people is the best way you can.
This episode of The Experiment was produced by Gabrielle Berbe with help from Salman Ahad Khan. Editing by Michael May and Julia Longoria. Reporting by Co Bragg. You can read Co Bragg's full article, Who Will Remember the Mississippi Murders, on our website, theatlantic.com slash experiment. Special thanks to Jewel McDonald, Dr. Julia Riley, and Ms. Gale and Mount Zion's first class Bible class. Fact check by Naomi Sharp. Sound design by Hannes Brown with additional engineering by Jennifer Munson. Music by Hannes Brown and Tasty Morsels. Our team also includes Tracy Hunt, Emily Botin, Jenny Lawton, Alyssa Eads, and me, Natalia Ramirez. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take the time to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. The Experiment is a co-production of The Atlantic and WNYC Studios. Thank you for listening.